Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to the Southern Hills Church of Christ. I know that some of you are our guests this morning, and we are certainly delighted to have you. We hope you'll come back and be with us as often as you can. If you are new to the area or for some other reason are looking for a church home, we would encourage you to consider Southern Hills. We would love to have you working and worshiping with us on a regular basis. There are a number of announcements, most of which are in the bulletin and will not require a lot of comment, but there are one or two others not in the bulletin I need to update you on. Glenda Sandrell, her daughter, Allison Terhune, was admitted to the hospital today. We don't have the name of that hospital. They are in need of prayers because she has a blood clot in her lungs. So in our prayers today, both public and private, please remember Allison Terhune. Also Karen Brethard, uh, who is a friend of some of our members, is fighting breast cancer. And notice our sick and shut-in lists are very long, as always. Remember the Donna Warren, Stony Warren family and your prayers, and we have a thank you note from them. Also a thank you note from Jane Brown, who is here today. We are certainly glad to see her. And I think you know that we have several folks down in Vienna, Georgia today. In fact, if you were on Facebook yesterday, you probably saw Chris Dowdy and the report of what they were doing down there. So please keep them in your prayers that they will have a good day today and that they will have a safe trip home. There are announcements about a future nursing home singing and Lambs of Light meeting. Notice the invitation to the bridal shower for Angel Burns on Sunday, August the 4th. That information is there before you. There is likewise a list of uh, upcoming events, speakers on the summer series, and notice on the back page, especially young people and parents, that on July the 25th, Southern Hills will be hosting the area-wide summer youth series. Please keep that in mind. If you can help with that in any way, that would be deeply appreciated. There are two inserts in the church bulletin. One is a letter from the elders. The other is an advertisement for a youth encouragement series here at the building on Saturday, August the 10th from 9 to 3 with Brother Brad Harrop doing the speaking. Please make note of that and maybe take it home, put it on the refrigerator or whatever, and make sure you keep it in your mind. We are glad to see you once again. Glad to have you so very much. Let's begin our service with prayer. Holy and almighty God of heaven and earth, God of wisdom and might and power, God of love and grace and mercy, how wonderful it is to be able to bow in your presence and to speak to you as our Father and our God. As we begin this time in worship this morning, Father, we pray that you will be with us and bless us. Bless this service that it will be according to your will, that you will be glorified and we will be edified. Be with those folks who are working down in Georgia. Please give them a successful weekend and a safe trip home. Bless us, be with us, use us to your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our first song this morning is 660, 660. If you would please be turning there if you use your book, otherwise it'll be on the screen behind me.
Before our opening prayer in Scripture, we'll sing number 26. 26, an empty mansion. The scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyards, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? 
But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, he loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Would you pray with me, please? Our most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to be here this morning, to glorify you, to sing praises to you, to learn about you. We're so grateful for this opportunity. Father, we, we thank you for all the blessings that you heap upon us that we do not deserve in any way, and yet we know that you care for us and that you are watchful for us. And we thank you for that. Father, we are so grateful to be a part of this congregation at Southern Hills. We ask you please to continue to bless this congregation, to bless our eldership, to bless our deacons, our teachers, that you will always be with them in their decisions and that you will guide them and that you will help them when burdens seem heavy that you will always keep them mindful of you, Father, of what you would have them to do. Father, there are so many individuals that are ill, that are struggling. You know all their names, Father. And for Every single one of those individuals that is on the hearts of someone here this morning, we ask you to please to, to bless them, to be with them, to heal them if it, will be their, if it will be your will. We ask you, Father, that you will bless this service this morning, that we will do all things in accordance with your will and in accordance with your word. And above all things, Father, we are grateful for your son and for the mercy and the forgiveness that we have through him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Sing number 359 as we begin to think about the events at the cross. 359.
Now it's time to observe the, observe the Lord's Supper. And I want to help you understand this is a special time. We do this every week, but it's not, it's not something routine. It is something routine in that we do it every week, but it's indeed a special time when we remember the Lord. Remember that Jesus came to wipe away our sins and cover us so that we might be, be pure and white in the Lord's sight. You or I couldn't approach the Lord ourselves, but through Jesus, with him being our intercessor, we can. So I ask you now to clear your minds while we we focus on this and we we, uh, take of the bread and the cup, the symbols that represent Jesus' body and blood. If I could ask you to pray with me, please. Father, we know that through your word you instructed us to have this memorial feast every first day of the week so that we would have top on our mind that you gave your son who was holy and sinless like you to come to earth and be like us so that we would have an intercessor in heaven. Father, we thank you for that gift We thank you for this memorial feast that allows us to not forget what Jesus willingly did for us by covering the sins of the world once for all time. We ask you now, Father, to bless the bread that represents his body that was given as a sacrifice for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray again for the fruit of the vine. Father, we again come to you and thank you for this fruit of the vine that you have specified in your word that we would take as part of the Lord's Supper to remember your son. Father, we thank you for this symbol because it represents your son's blood, the only thing that can cover us from sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
in addition to the Lord's Supper, uh, God's Word also instructs us to lay by and store or the work here would continue. So we're going to do that now. And one thing I thought about uh, today as I was preparing for this is that you know the early Christians in Acts had a spirit of sharing and giving. They didn't uh, think strictly of themselves. You know, if someone needed something, they gave it. And the only thing I've, I've kept on my mind is that you know the Lord doesn't need our money. An omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful God is going to accomplish his will whether we give or not. But he knows we need to give to keep our, our, our soul safe from greed and, and the things that, that greed produces in our soul. So as we, as, we, as we think about the giving, remember it's not just your money, it's not just, it's not just your material gifts, it's your time and your talents and, and your heart. So, you know, think about, you know, making sure that, that you know, you don't hold on to your money so tightly that, that God can't get in. If I could ask you to pray through, please now. Father, we thank you for your encouraging us and our requirement to be generous toward others. It helps us remember, Father, how generous you are to us and how little we deserve what you've given. And Father, our generosity helps us to be that light in the world that others can see because most people in the world aren't very generous. So when we're generous and helpful with our time and with our money, people see that and they realize we're different and they wanna be like us and they see your light coming through us. Father, we thank you for that gift and we pray, Father, that, that we're doing our serving and giving according to your will. And if not, Father, we ask for forgiveness and, and to put us back on the right path. Again, Father, we thank you for the requirement we have to give that we would show your light to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be singing song 103 for the song of invitation. That's the song right after the lesson. And before Brother Danny brings us the word, we'll sing number 243. If you would please be standing, 243, Home of the Soul.
I forgot one very important announcement that I do need to make. There will be no kids' corner tonight. Uh, both Andy and Cody are in Georgia. They will be on their way back, and so there will not be a kids' corner tonight. So please keep that in mind. I'm going to begin by turning in the Old Testament to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Let me tell you a little bit about Micah before I read this. And let me tell you also, by the way, that I am using PowerPoint this morning. I don't often do that, and there is no guarantee that it will work with me trying to do it. So if it doesn't work, we've got two very capable technicians back in the little booth, and they can just take control of this thing, which is not a bad idea anyway. But I would like for you to see, as well as hear, what we're trying to say. But this part that I'm about to do now is not on PowerPoint. In the 8th century, before Christ was born, there was a prophet, a minor prophet, by the name of Micah. Micah prophesied in Judah, which was the southern kingdom. He was contemporary with Isaiah the prophet. And while we know a whole lot about Isaiah, comparatively speaking, we know very little about Micah. And yet in chapter 6, there is a verse that is tremendously important, and I want to use it as an introduction to the lesson this morning. Micah says, He, that is God, has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The question that the prophet asks is what is important right now. What does the Lord require of you? I'm not going to give the answers that Micah gave to his own question. I'm going to take the answers this morning from the New Testament. I want you to see three things, time permitting, that God requires of us according to the New Testament gospel. And the first of these is that God wants you and me to grow. There are any number of verses in the Bible that emphasize that powerfully and, and clearly. We're only going to look at a couple because I think they will actually be more than sufficient by themselves. And the first one is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Now let me set the scene for you just a little bit. Peter died by being crucified upside down, most likely in Rome, prior to A.D. 67. That makes his two letters, 1 and 2 Peter, among the latest written in the New Testament. Peter is writing, as you would expect, to Christians. 
He may be especially writing, as it appears from the introduction to the first letter, to those who have become Christians out of the Jewish faith. But it's in this second letter that he summarizes what he has said in both letters because we're very near the end of letter number two. He tells us that we are to grow. There's the word. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now I've told you many times over through the years that you cannot understand the Bible unless you understand the words of the Bible. And I know sometimes taking verses apart and looking at them word by word and phrase by phrase as sometimes is necessary, I know that can be tedious. But I also know that that's really the only way that we're going to come to a full understanding of what God's will is for our lives. There is a prominent scholar living in the greater Chicago area named Donald Carson. Donald Carson likes to refer to this as unpacking the Scriptures. And that's exactly what we're about to do for just a moment or two with this one and with the Scriptures that follow. Notice first of all the word grow. That word is stated as an imperative, beloved. It is not optional. It is required of you and me if we're going to be the faithful sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ that we spend our entire lives growing in the faith. Now how are we going to do that? Is there some kind of magical formula? Of course not. We grow in the faith by reading, studying, absorbing, and living by God's inspired Word, the Bible. Peter says to Christians of that generation and of this generation and of all generations, you've got to keep on growing your whole life through spiritually. And you're to grow in two things. Number one, you're to grow in grace. Well, we all know what grace is. We've heard the Sunday school definition, it's unmerited favor. Or someone else's definition, it's unmerited love. But the point is, we understand that we are saved by grace through faith, that that is the gift of God, it is not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, his poem, if you will, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before time that we should walk in them. We're saved by the grace of God. But it's not grace only. Now, a few years ago, several years ago now, there were some among us in the brotherhood who said we need to focus on grace only. No, we don't. Not any more than we would focus on faith only. We are saved, Paul said by inspiration in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, we are saved by grace through, through or by means of, faith. So you grow in the grace, and then you grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here again, how are we going to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if we don't study God's Word? Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling a right or rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, the key there is not study, though that's important. Some translate it give diligence, but the key there is to have the approval of God by rightly dividing the word of truth. What about 1 Peter 3.15? We're to be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks us a reason for the hope that is within us, a reasoned defense with meekness and fear. We cannot teach what we do not know. We cannot live 
what we do not know. We sometimes treat Bible classes as if they are a formality, or even worse, as if they're not important. I firmly believe that what happens in this pulpit every time anybody steps into this pulpit must be some teaching. But we have classes, and in those classes, that's exactly what we're doing. We're getting into the depth of a passage, or we should be, and teaching people what God's will is for our lives. So we grow in the grace and we grow in the knowledge. Now here's something about this knowledge. There are different words for knowledge in the New Testament. They're pretty much related to one root. But the point is, and I've said this before, so this is not new to you. There is a prefix on the word knowledge right here that is not on the word every time it appears in the Bible. The prefix is spelled in our letters, E-P-I. It's epi. And what that is, is an intensive. It says we've got to get down to some serious, in-depth study of the Word of God. I don't believe... There has ever been a time in the history of humankind when there has been a greater and more challenges to our faith than right now. And just one teeny tiny example of those challenges is all found in that little box you've got in your den or living room. It's just godless propaganda, one thing right after another. We are being bombarded by this stuff. And Christian people can't afford to be indifferent. We can't afford to say that doesn't mean anything to me or that doesn't matter to me, doesn't matter to my children, doesn't matter to my grandchildren. Of course it does. If we're not armed for the fight, doesn't one of our songs say that? If we are not equipped with that that equipment we have to have, according to Paul in Ephesians 6, if we are not equipped with all of that, how are we going to stand strong and faithful for the Lord Jesus Christ? We've got to grow. But there's another passage. Next to Romans, which I think is the greatest letter ever written, My favorite New Testament book or letter is Ephesians. And I think it's important for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons is the theme. The theme is Christ and His church. And it's evenly divided, Ephesians is, into six chapters, and the first three are doctrinal, and the last three are practical. And after the doctrine has been laid down by the inspiration of the Apostle Paul in the first three chapters, you come to the opening of chapter 4, and wham, you're right in the middle of the practical application. If you study Ephesians 4 in detail, you see there God's guidebook for how to be the church. It's as clear and intense and in-depth as anything found anywhere in the Word of God. You look at that. It talks about so many different things we don't even have time to touch on this morning. But all of a sudden you find yourself down in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 and here you are. You're back at growth again. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. And he began to talk about the unity of the faith back in the first verses of the chapter, didn't he? We come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge, and again, same word as in 2 Peter 3.18. The knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect 
or mature man. One translation which I like a little bit better than this is, we grow unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, you and I are never going to be as perfect as Christ was. There's that verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, that every time I think about that, it scares me half to death. Be ye perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Now, wait a minute. It is not humanly possible for me to be as perfect as my God is. Nor is it humanly possible for me to be as perfect or mature as my Savior is. But that doesn't mean I don't try. And I'm not talking about salvation by trying. No, not at all. But I am saying that when you are born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 1 through 5, when you become a new man or a new woman in Christ, right here in Ephesians 4, when you grow, when you become a Christian, you start growing, and as I've said already, you keep growing all of your life through. Now, let's, let's make the obvious application. Many of you have children. Some of you have grandchildren. Some of the really fortunate among us have great-grandchildren. You're willing to do everything you can possibly do to make sure that those sweet children grow up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But you want them to be healthy physically as well, right? You feed them the right kind of food. If they get sick, you take them to the doctor. The doctor gives you a prescription. You give them the medicine. You check their height. You check their weight. You check everything about them on a regular basis because you want them to grow physically. But what is even more important than that is that they grow spiritually. But we nurture our children so they will grow and be the kind of men and women that they should be. My point is... If it's important to grow and be healthy physically, how important is it to grow and be healthy spiritually? You and I, we're really very lucky people. We have a Father in heaven who wants more than anything else listen to me who wants more than anything else for us to come and live with him and he's doing everything within his almighty power to make that a reality because he understands even better than we do how important it is that we grow spiritually and we be the kind of spiritual men and women and boys and girls that we can be, but only because of God through Jesus Christ. Keep on growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're getting behind already and we're not going to get through. That's not uncommon, is it? Secondly, glorify. Grow and glorify. The angels, remember them? Luke chapter 2, verse 14, they're talking to the shepherds. What did they say? Glory to God in the highest and on the earth peace and goodwill toward men. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, watch, or whatever you do, you do everything that you do to the glory of the God of heaven and earth. We should not do those things that will not bring glory to God. We should not fail to do those things that will bring glory to God. I can never talk about this.
but what I see in my mind. The preacher I love more dearly than anybody except maybe Jesus and Paul. And that'd be Bachelor Barrett Baxter. And he would stand up there in that meek and quiet and humble way, brilliant man, great preacher, Bible scholar. He would hold the Bible in this hand like this. He would do his fist like, he wasn't going to punch anybody, that wasn't the point, but for emphasis sake. And he would say to us in Bible classes and in sermons from the Hillsborough pulpit, he would say to us, man's greatest purpose is to glorify God. Absolutely. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do everything you do to the glory of God. And so Paul says to the Colossians, whatever you do in word or deed, that's the same as everything. You do all in the name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Thirdly and finally, you go. I've got two passages of Scripture. I can't get to one of them, probably won't get to the other one. On your own time, okay? Get yourself a translation of the Bible, I would suggest, other than the one you traditionally use. For me, traditionally, it's the New King James. I've got the words I wanted to read to you underlined. But take a... You choose. I mean, get a good one, get an accurate one, get a reliable one. Don't get the cotton patch version or something like that. And go read Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And stop every once in a while as you're working your way through it and close your eyes. Don't say anything. Just close your eyes. And while you're thinking about what Paul said in those two chapters, think about that song we didn't sing this morning. Matt, that's my fault, not yours. I would love to have sung, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. How beautiful heaven must be. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Where's that? That's heaven. We have some folks here in the audience today. I'm not going to embarrass you by saying who you are, but you can figure out who some of them are. Who are from a county just a little ways across the Tennessee River going west. Henderson County. About right now, there's a little brick church building on the Christian Chapel Darden Road. And there are people gathered there right now just about ready to begin Sunday school. After Sunday school, they'll have worship. After worship, they'll have dinner on the grounds. Oh, they got a fine kitchen and a fine fellowship room downstairs, but they still put up something outside. Dinner on the grounds. And man, I'm telling you, everything there will be good and some will be even better than that. It's homecoming at Christian Chapel. They had their first one in 1947, right after World War II. My mom and dad and I would get up every third Sunday of July morning early and we would get ready and we would go by a few blocks to my grandmother's house, my dad's mom, and pick her up and off we'd go to the Christian chapel for homecoming and the beginning of the gospel meeting. No matter how early we got to my grandmother's house, she was always ready. She'd probably been ready before daylight. She had on the best dress she had. She always had on that hat. And she had that purse that she carried in her arms, or on her arm. It was the grandest day of the year for her. 
She'd been born and raised in that community. My dad was born and raised in that community. She only got to go back about one Sunday a year, but she would see people there, relatives and friends she hadn't seen since last year or maybe the year before that or beyond that. It was more, meant more to her than Christmas or Thanksgiving or her birthday or all three rolled into one. Homecoming. She passed away in 1960. Linda and I were at Christian Chapel Friday in the cemetery, putting flowers on her grave and on the grave of my great-grandfather for whom I'm named. Homecoming. Folks, one of these days, by God's love and grace and mercy, we're going home. The old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're going to our real, upper, better home. And how beautiful heaven is going to be. So if you're not a Christian, the thing right now you need to do more than anything else is submit yourself in obedience to the gospel of Christ by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. If you need to do that, if you need to be restored, if you need the prayers of the church, whatever, please come as we stand to sing. To Jesus, do not say, re enter in at mercy's gate. Oh, delay not till the morrow, lest thy coming be too late. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come, come today. Come to Jesus. Thank you very much, Brother Danny. We'll be meeting again this evening at 5 p.m. for another worship. We have Kids Corner at 445 for those that have children as well. And of course, we'll have our midweek Bible study. No Kids Corner today? No Kids Corner. Probably announced it and I was too busy doing something else. I'll make up for that by singing the song that Danny wished we had sung. We had that planned. If you would, please turn in your songbooks for our closing hymn to bring it up here. Number 242. Number 242. We'll sing the first verse only, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer to our Bible classes.
Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for this wonderful day that you've given to us, this opportunity to come together and to worship and learn more about you. We ask that as we go off to our classes that we are able to learn more from your word and that we are able to understand what we're being taught. We thank you for giving us your words so that we know how to live our lives and we ask that our studies of it today will be beneficial to our lives. We thank you most of all for your son and it's through his name we pray. Amen.